Hey everyone, my name is Eddie Joe. I'm an intensive care doctor who teaches a lot of stuff on Instagram, YouTube, my website, um, my Twitter account. I'm just trying to teach everywhere because I'm not an academia and I love teaching. So today I'm going to be talking about SCBO2 and SBO2. Now, I know that you've all heard these fancy terms before like mixed venous, blood gases, SCBO2, SBO2 thrown around the ICU all the time. Regardless of whether you're a nurse, respiratory therapist, medical student, resident, or even a fellow, sometimes these terms could be quite confusing where you're like, what's SCBO2 and what's SBO2? And you know, you don't use these values every day. Well, most people don't use these values every day. So it's easy to see how it could become tricky. And I'm going to teach you a little bit about where these values come from and what you could do with them. But ultimately, I can't get into every little nuance of it. Okay, so starting off with the SVO2. This is the one that comes from a Swan Gans catheter. So let's do a little bit of terrible anatomy that I'm going to draw right now. Pardon my lack of ability to draw. And we'll go ahead and draw the right atrium of sorts. And then this will be the right ventricle, which will go into the pulmonary arteries. I told you this was going to be awful, guys. And then this right here is the SVC. This is the IVC. Here is the right atrium. If this thing decides to work, right atrium, right ventricle. I told you it was terrible. So a Swan Gans catheter is also called a pulmonary artery catheter that you can either put in through the uh, SVC or the IVC, depends on who floats it. And it basically goes into the pulmonary artery, okay? And that is where the SVO2 comes from, okay? And what it stands for is venous oxygen saturation. And if you just go look here, the V is for venous, the O2 is right here, and saturation goes right there. So it's SVO2, like so. Um, the SVO2, gives you a combination of blood because it's all from right here it all it's all right here it gives you a combination of blood from both the ivc and the svc and this is going to be important when i discuss now the next the next uh, thing that we're going to measure which is the scvo2 let me do it in red the scvo2 and the scvo2 comes from a central line and many of us have placed central lines or will be trained to place central lines. And a central line is usually placed for the, for the sake of this conversation. This central line will be placed in the SVC. So it will therefore have to come from either the IJ, the axillary vein, or from a subclavian vein. And the SCVO2, if I go back to my white, uh, excuse me, back to my red. If this thing decides to work. Nope, I guess it's not going to work. Um, it gives you blood from the SBC. But the SCVO2 is the central venous O2 saturation. And that's where the C from here comes from, from the central. Saturation is the S and venous O2, like that. That makes sense. So now you know that the central is from a central line for the sake of learning it in an easier manner. I know it could get confusing because at least when I was listening to this the first time, I said, hey, the central, the SCVO2 central, central should be right here, right? Because it's more central in the patient's body. But no, that's not accurate. That's just meant to, uh, to confuse us a little bit. So you might say, okay, between the SCVO2 and the SVO2, what's the difference? Are they equal? Well, it turns out that they're not equal and therefore they're not exactly interchangeable, but for the sake of trending, it is interchangeable. And here's why. As I mentioned before, the SCVO2 gets blood from the superior vena cava and the SVO2 gets blood from the superior vena cava as well as the inferior vena cava. There's a difference between in the concentration of oxygen between the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. And the reason for that is because in the superior vena cava, 
you get blood that's primarily from the head and from the upper extremities. And it turns out that the head and the upper extremities use less oxygen than the inferior vena cava, which covers all the other organs, including the liver, the gut, um, the lower extremities, etc., kidneys. So the IVC has less oxygen in the blood because more was consumed. Does that make sense? It should, because it's not that difficult to understand. So how much is the difference between the two? And it turns out the difference, generally speaking, is 5 to 6%. However, in patients who are sick, patients who are in shock, that percentage actually increases. So it's not as reliable. But all in all, placing swan GANS catheters, you know, floating swans, is something that we don't do very often. Although we do do it quite a bit in the CVICU, and it makes taking care of patients a whole lot easier. I personally like swan GANS catheters in appropriate settings. Now, some of the some of the uses of you know using the SVO2 is to estimate cardiac output, and I'll get to that in a second as well as understand the physiologic state. It helps to resuscitate patients. It helps understand and treat hypoxemia, and it helps to rapidly estimate shunt, shunt fraction. However, those things I'm not gonna discuss here because I'm gonna bore the crud out of you. Um, what are the normal values for, for example, SCVO2? Because that's what we're gonna use more often because it's easier to place a central line than it is to place a swan. And if the SEVO2 is greater than 70%, we are happy. Whoops, that's not a happy face. This is a happy face. We are happy because that, generally speaking, means that the patient is doing A-OK. -okay. Now, if it's less than 50%, that means we need to be doctors and clinicians. We need to figure out what in the world is going on with this patient. Why is their SEVO2 so darn low? If you are between 50 to 70%, you are in a gray area. You don't really know if the patient lives there or if they have something going on that you need to figure out. So this part right here makes it very tricky. Here in, in the 70%, like I said, patient is happy. You're happy, everybody happy, Hakuna Matata. If it's less than 50%, people are upset. We gotta fix whatever's going on with this patient. And then how do we try to determine what is going on with this patient? Well, first of all, you usually know why they're sick. If it's sepsis, if it's cardiogenic shock or whatnot, this could be helpful. But ultimately, there are a couple things that we need to know about SEVO2. SEVO2 tells us about um, oxygen delivery, so that's DO2, and it tells us about oxygen consumption, which is VO2. So let's, over, let's go over DO2 first. DO2, oxygen delivery, could be affected by three things. One, two, three. Let's not make it too complicated for ourselves. The first thing for oxygen delivery is that you need to have oxygen. So PaO2 is the first thing we're gonna look at. The next thing for oxygen delivery is how's, ox how's oxygen delivered? By hemoglobin. So we need to know what hemoglobin is for the patient. And the third thing is cardiac output. And we'll go over that in a second. But the treatments are going to be pretty straightforward. And this is why I like doing these videos. If the PaO2 is low, you're going to give the patient more O2. Whether you have to intubate them or use some other methodology to give them oxygen, go ahead and do that. If their hemoglobin is low, and that's the reason why you're not delivering enough oxygen, you give them hemoglobin. Not bad, huh? Could be harder. Now, if their cardiac output is the problem, we need to think about this a little bit deeper. And this is where we become good clinicians. Remember that cardiac output is equal to stroke volume times heart rate. And with regards to stroke volume, we need to see, uh, does the patient need, do we need to give the patient IV fluids, for example? Do we need to give them inotrope? I always spell this wrong. Inotrope to increase contractility or, um, is their ventricle just shot and they need some sort of uh, left ventricular assist device? So these are different things that we need to look at. And sometimes we could get an echocardiogram and try to figure this out. Now, if the patient's problem is their heart rate, let's say that they came out of surgery out of the CV, ICU, CV, OR, and they have a pacemaker, you could go ahead and increase the heart rate on the pacemaker. 
And you know, when people are sometimes in septic shock, and this is a pro tip that you all could do and consider, is that some people have their pacemaker set at like 60, some elderly people, you know, who have a sick sinus syndrome or whatever, and they come in in septic shock. And they're, they're not able to generate an increased heart rate. So what you could try to do is speak to their friendly neighborhood cardiologist or EP specialist who's in the hospital, and you say, hey, by the way, this patient's in septic shock and their heart rate is sitting at 60. Could we get them a little bit more cardiac output by increasing the heart rate? And a lot of times that will actually, uh, you know, it's not a cure-all, but it's something you could do to try to help your patient out. So these are the three things for oxygen delivery. So the DO2, you could give the patient oxygen, you could give them hemoglobin if they need it, or do things to increase their cardiac output. Sounds good? Good. Hopefully that wasn't too hard. So the next step that we should do is look at their oxygen consumption. And a lot of times this is just uh, sorted out by taking care of the patient's symptoms. And here we have five things that we could look at. Two, three, four, and five. First one being, and if you think about this from a logical standpoint, it kind of makes sense. What, do, what could you do to consume more oxygen in your body? Well, if you're going under some stress, that will help do it. If you're under pain, that will help do it. If you have hyperthermia, you know, fever, shivering, etc., that will make you consume more oxygen. If you're shivering, that will also increase your oxygen requirement and your oxygen uh, utilization, excuse me, and the work of breathing. So if you have somebody who's huffing and puffing, uh, you know that they're going to be consuming a good amount of oxygen in the process of doing so. So these are things that you could go ahead and fix with different medications. If you have to go ahead and intubate the patient for the work of breathing, that's okay. If you have to give the patient something like Demerol or Buspar for their shivering, those aren't medical recommendations. That's something you should look for. If they're hypothermic, they need acetaminophen. If they're in pain and they also need something for the pain, those are all things that you could treat to fix the oxygen delivery, excuse me, the oxygen consumption. So ultimately, I hope that makes sense as to what the differences are between the SCVO2 and the SVO2. Again, the C means get it out of the central line. And the one that's shorter is the one that you get out of the PA catheter, which many of you don't know how to float or interpret the numbers for. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's all I wanted to say about this. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Please, like this is a thumb up. Give me a thumb up because it helps the channel grow and subscribe because um, it shows that I'm doing something good and it motivates me to make more videos. Ultimately, thank you very much. Thank you and have a great day. Bye.